Well, uh, you're, okay, you don't have to be here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, it just got fixed, just, just like that. Would you no. It was Chris's presence. Was, Thank you, Chris. It was Chris's oh, presence, yeah. apparently. It's your electric personality that causes great distortion. I can, and I'm a grounding influence. I, I, think, that's, I think that's the reason. I, I, was, I was thinking somebody is going to make a joke about theoretical physicists now that they, whenever they stand next to some machine, they, they break down, and this is what they say that happens. Okay. I've never talked with a microphone. Okay, thank you for your answer. Yeah, let's not try that. No, I don't. No, no, we're not talking about that. We shouldn't off on and off anymore. Okay, I don't trust. I don't trust you anymore. Okay, now so welcome. Um, course on relativistic electrodynamics. Um, most of you I've already spoken uh, beforehand. Uh, some people informed about whether they could follow the, the, the course and what would be in there and everything. Some people requested waivers just out of sheer interest who of you were the people who actually followed the course in electromagnetism okay, it's about 50 percent or so okay that's fine uh, the other people are you worried that you might have a lack in background now fortunately this first half or what's ever left of it uh, we're going to use for exactly that, just to give you some idea of what that or, uh, course was about. There is some stuff in there about electric fields and magnetic fields, right? And that's, that's the whole course on electromagnetism. And uh, that particular course would then tell you what is an electric field, what is a magnetic field, how are they related to each other and such. Now, what we're going to do in this course is going to take that relationship a lot deeper than the people have had during the electromagnetism course. Now, in electromagnetism, you also get all these exercises on how to calculate the magnetic field here and the electric field over there and such. I mean, typically exercises that involve lots of integrations and such. Now, we're going to do some of these just to get you reacquainted with electric fields and magnetic fields, but that's not the object of this course. That was what the other course was for. This is really just the theoretical deepening of the connection between electric fields and magnetic fields. And as you can already tell uh, from the title, that means that the theory of relativity is in there. Again, first half is just talking, no mathematics. I mean, I might flash a formula or so, but there's no actual, let's now sit down and calculate such and such. That, that's going to be the second half. Um, so it's just an overview. And feel very free to interrupt me, ask questions, or supplement me, because it's also very educational for me, so I know exactly where everybody is and such. Let's go through this. It's sort of a historical overview, uh, taking some quick steps here and there to get to the actual meet and the conclusions of things and well let's just start uh, these guys of course you've all seen before heard of before uh, maxwell of course he's the guy who puts the, the theory of uh, electromagnetism into his current mathematical form the form that we still use today uh, but he could only do that after legions of physicists had done experiments on electric fields and magnetic fields and uh, to name only three it's a very incomplete list is Faraday, Ursat, and Franklin, all three I'm, I'm going to mention later on during this first half. Um, and after they had done all these experiments on electric, electricity and magnetism, it was Maxwell put everything together into this mathematical form. Now, the relativity, I will say something about in the end. So, originally, there should also be a little picture of Einstein here, but uh, there's a picture of Einstein later on, so you can see. So, uh, very simple beginnings. What is electricity? And of course, everybody knows what that is because you just plug your computer into a socket or something and you get the electricity and power and everything. But if you go back a couple of hundred years, and of course, it was ridiculously difficult for people to understand that there is this phenomenon in nature that says that objects tend to attract each other or to repel each other. Now, go back in time. You talk to somebody from, say, the 16th century, some, somebody in medieval times or so, you say, well, I have this book here. And... Um, what happens to this book if I let it go? And they will say, well, it falls due to the force of gravity. And nobody had any idea that there was something else going on than just the force of gravity. They really thought that it was some sort of alchemy, right? Chemistry that happened, that's, that's something that makes processes happen. And apart from that, there's gravity pulling things down to Earth. Now, you come along with your 21st century physics background, and you say, well, there's also this thing, and that also pulls things together or repels them from each other. And then these people say, oh, I'm sorry, I've never seen that before. I've never seen things just attract each other just willy-nilly without it being the Earth, say, without it being gravity. And I've certainly never seen things repel each other. Well, that is very true. So this 
was a ridiculously huge discovery that apparently there's this other type of interaction between objects that does more than gravity does. It can actually push things away from each other and can attract each other without any use of gravity. So it was really a new thing to discover this new force. Now, just to name a couple of things. Uh, all of this, of course, you know, but I really want you to look at this from the viewpoint of this medieval guy who have never seen any of these experiments before. Uh, it appears that matter, most of it, comes in two varieties. And some of these varieties attract each other, some of them repel each other. Of course, you know why that is. That is charge. Yet, if I were to ask you what exactly is charge, I mean, um, I, I doubt that you would have a very sufficient explanation of what that is, except for what it does, right? And if you go to this medieval guy and you ask, so can you point to something that has charge, he will not, not be able to point at anything because everything seems to be electrically neutral. Again, this is why it's such a huge discovery that apparently things have this property, and when they have this property, they start pulling on each other, even though there's nothing in their direct vicinity that actually has this charge, this thing. Now, of course, this charge comes in two varieties. We call it plus and minus. I really want to stress here that's just a name. You could have also called it birds and burning or something like that, or apples and oranges. Right? There's apple charge and there's orange charge. Um, of course, the reason that they call it plus and minus was from the experimental fact that if you have this one object that has this early type of charge, and you have this other object that has this birth type of charge, and you put them together, then this whole thing acts as if there is no charge. No birth or charge, no early charge. As if these two things cancel each other out. Now, given that that's an experimental fact, just as a little mnemonic, you could say, well, it is called a plus or minus, because plus or minus also cancel each other out. I really just want to stress that us calling this plus and minus really has nothing to do with nature. It's just a name that we picked that sort of fits the experiments. You put two of these together and they cancel out. Okay, now, of course you know that if you have this birth charge, you have the other birth charge and they start pushing each other apart. If you have this birth charge and birth charge, early charge and early charge, uh, and opposites, right, birth and early, they start attracting each other. Um, and this is just all experimental fact. You can really just do this experiment. Um, Okay, examples, of course we know now, the medieval guy would not know that, but examples of things that have this birth charge, that's called plus from now on, are the protons, right, everything in the nucleus, except for neutrons, and the electrons that swirl around that have this other charge, the negative one. Interesting question is why don't they fall on top of each other here, by the way, does anyone know? I mean, they, they attract each other, so why don't they collapse and just make this zero charge? That's the, exactly the right answer, right here, right now. The uncertainty principle, yes. It's quantum mechanics that says it's not allowed. Uh, you might have had some high school teacher or something like that who would probably say, well, it's just like planets and they move around in circles, and because of the circle, I mean, it's being pulled inward, but at the same time it wants to go forward, so by inertia it makes a circle now. But that's completely wrong. Okay, that's classical mechanics. This thing is not classical mechanics. Now, no quantum mechanics in this course, but just a little side note, this is the reason why atoms don't collapse onto each other, even though it's a plus and a minus. Okay, now, the reason that this medieval guy would not be able to see these charges is for the simple fact that the electro uh, uh, interaction, this electric force between charges is so ridiculously strong. Um, you might know that there are four fundamental forces. The electric one is the second strongest of the list. Strongest is a strong nuclear force, and you have electric force, nuclear force, and gravity is ridiculously strong. And that's exactly why it's so hard to find charges that are not paired to one of these other unlike charges. Right? If you have a bird over here, and it has its own early, and you pull it away from each other, this force is so strong that nature tries to do everything that it can to get everything back together, to make everything neutral again. Again, this is the reason why it's so difficult for people back in the day to have found this in the first place, because nature, because of the strongness of this force, makes sure that everything tends to be electrically neutral. You have to build machines in order to get these things apart from each other. Or you can just pet the cat that also works, or go to the or something like that. Okay, now, here's the first of the formulas I'm going to flash. Um, people decided, well, okay, um, if you have this charge, Let's make a little drawing, I'll do it in a sec, but if you have this little charge somewhere and you bring this other charge next to it, they start feeding each other even though they have no physical contact with each other. So, 
um, it's as if one of these charges are surrounded by some sphere of influence that tells this other charge that the other guy is around. Again, this is very strange type of physics. Think back of the time when people just thought, well, things only move when you push uh, against them, right? Newtonian mechanics and such. And now you say, well, things can actually feel each other without actually physically touching. And then Faraday, one of the guys that I, from the experiments that I uh, showed you just before, Faraday came up with the luminous idea. There's a pun there if you think about it. With the luminous idea that maybe, yeah, yeah, I know, it's extremely funny, but you can, the electric field is made up out of virtual photons. So luminous. Anyway, just explaining for people at home. I don't expect you to laugh, it's just a crappy joke. Anyhow, you have these two charges, and Faraday came up with the idea, well, maybe if they're not physically touching, there's something mediating this force from one charge to the next. They call it the electric field. Now, that is a ridiculously strong concept that really changed the whole field of physics, because now everything that we do is, is, is written in terms of fields. Uh, the really difficult quantum mechanics, as you know, everything is written in types of quantum fields in this particular case, but the idea of field was really new. It's not just a different way of writing a formula, it's actually a physical entity of itself that obeys laws. You can write down laws of what the fields do. And of course, electrodynamics is exactly about that. Now, Faraday made the following convention. He said, well, this force that these two charges feel when they start pulling or pushing on each other is really just the influence field of this one guy times the charge of the particle that's being pushed or pulled. So in this sense, it's really just a uh, definition of the electric field. But again, the electric field itself has properties that we're going to discuss. Now, we're going to represent this electric field by something called field lines. I'm sure you've all seen this before in your electromagnetism course. And if not, I'm going to draw a picture in a second. Field lines will tell charges in what direction they should move. Again, a picture will follow in a second. And the density of the field lines indicates the strength of the push. So here's the idea. If you have one of these charges, let's make it a plus charge, and you put it somewhere in the middle, and I bring this other charge, doesn't matter if it's plus or minus, I bring this other charge over here-ish, then they will start feeling each other even though there's no physical contact. Again, Faraday says, well, it's because there's something in the surrounding area of this charge that tells the other one that it should move. It's called the electric field. Put this thing here, and the arrows can tell you in exactly what direction this extra charge in my hand should move. By convention, I'm talking about a plus charge. The arrows tell you in what direction a plus charge would move in this electric field. So if I put it here, it will move radially out. Now, why is exactly this particular arrangement of arrows? That's an experimental fact. It's called Coulomb's law. Now, um, Coulomb also found that the further you are away of the charge, the one in the middle, the less you feel of it. It's just like gravity in that sense. And it's completely depicted by this picture here as well. Because at the moment you're further away, you cross less of these lines because the lines wafer out radially. So the density of the amount of lines tells you something about how strong this field is. It's not the length of the arrow or something like that. It's just how many arrows cross through your body if you're standing at a certain uh, particular position. Right? It's really just like standing next to a radiator. The closer you are, the more of these heat rays go through your body, the warmer you get. It's very much the same idea. It's not just a picture, by the way. If you would write down the actual formula for this law, this law that tells you what the electric field is at a certain distance, it's exactly mathematically analogous to this particular arrangement, this idea of these field lines. One other thing, field lines cannot cross uh, where is it? Uh, it's, it's not on this slide. Field lines cannot cross. You cannot have two field lines crossing in front of each other. Do you understand why? Just from what you've heard up to now. There's a suggestion. A field line tells you in what direction a charge should move. Exactly. It's got to move in two, two directions at once, right? So field lines are defined such that they cannot cross, which makes it very diff uh, easy in a second to draw field lines for a particular arrangement. So that's the idea. Now again, the convention is that the plus charges are the ones that be are being pushed by these arrows. That's just the definition of the electric field. That also means that if you have a negative over here in the middle with its electric field, 
arrows of that electric field will point inward because this is where the plus charges will go. And that's what you get. Of course, if something that has no charge whatsoever, there's no field lines, you can place a charge here, it will go nowhere. You can stand there. Or maybe by gravity force or something like that. So that's the idea. Now, before I continue, I said something like, <coughs> this is something about this picture being exactly mathematically correct. Let me give you an idea of that. Lomb found out that the electric field, which is a vector, so everything I'm going to write with a little vector arrow means is a vector, is a direction, as you can tell, because it pushes you in some direction, and a strength, how strongly it does so. Coulomb found out that the strength of the electric field is the strength of the amount of charge in the middle, divided by r squared, where r is the distance where you put this other charge. Right? You put this charge here, the smaller charge, but the distance between the big charge, big Q, and my small charge in my hand is distance r. There's no angular dependence. It's a radial field. It doesn't matter if I put my smaller charge here-ish or over there-ish, it will be pushed by exactly the same amount as long as it's at the same distance. Now, this law that it just found empirically tells you that the further away you are, twice as far away, four times as small your electric field will be. Or in other words, feel four times less force. And that's exactly in that picture over there. Because remember, I told you that the amount of force that you feel goes with how many lines go through your body. Right? The body of that particular test charge you must be pushed around. If you increase the distance here, how much bigger does the area get around this charge? Draw a picture here. Here's big Q, here's the field lines, and because it's a radial field, in other words, it doesn't care about direction, these lines go through a sphere. Now make the sphere two times as big. How much bigger does the area get of the sphere? Of the square. Of the square, because the surface of the sphere is four times pi times r squared, the radius. But that means that if I'm close by, I get a certain amount of, of, of line sticking through every square meter of the sphere. But if I'm two times as far away, the same amount of lines has, has to be smeared over a four times smaller sphere. So that means the strength becomes uh, four times smaller. So this whole idea of standing further away getting four times less density is exactly the same thing as this formula that says two times further away gives you four times less strength. So this formula really is exactly the same thing as that picture over there, which makes it easy. People who don't, don't like formulas just use pictures. It's exactly the same information. So that's very nice. Okay. Now, these felt obey the superposition principle. This, again, is not trivial. Superposition means if you have two of these fields at one point, they just add up to one big field. Again, this is not trivial. There are many things in physics that if you have two times the influence, they will not add up to a bigger amount of influence. Here's a very good example. Uh, spaghetti. Well, we, 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 I, guess, we, I guess there's people around who like spaghetti, yeah? Okay. Um, it's another example. Um, strawberry ice cream. It's nice too, right? Okay, add spaghetti and strawberry ice cream. Does it? Does it Increase the amount of niceness of the dish. <laughs> okay, you're nodding. Okay. <laughs> as, as in one big dish, not just a, a starter and a dessert. Okay, well, generally speaking, <laughs> people would agree that there are some things that you just cannot simply add up. Uh, the more serious example, of course, is again an uh, example of quantum mechanics, where the amount of quantum field here plus the amount of quantum fields from someplace else added together does not just give you twice that amount because you have to square the thing modulo square to get the probability and adding two things and squaring them is not quite the same thing as adding two things so it's completely non-trivial that two fields added together will give you one big total field by just adding them but here they do now if you have a plus charge and a minus charge over here and you want to apply this law Coulomb's law to each situation then it becomes sort of a mess because some in the middle you have to add the two fields together and you can imagine it becomes a complicated uh, mathematical exercise. 
But now we know that you can also just draw these lines. Things become very simple, right? So what you do here, you just draw out the lines as if the other one is not around. And you do the same thing over there. Of course, here the lines point inward, because this is where the plus charges want to go. And then you know that these lines should not cross. So that means that these have no choice but to connect themselves to each other. That's the only way to do it. And you can very then simply see that it should be this total picture that you get out. Without having the, ever having done the mathematics, you still get the correct picture. So that's very nice. Now, before we continue, because of the 4 pi r squared, that's really here, right? It's the amount of field lines that you have to smear over the, the, the area of the sphere. People tend to write 4 pi here. It's the it's 4 pi of the area of the sphere. Now note that translating this picture to this formula would still work if I were to add any number here, any number lambda or so. It would still have the same geometrical properties. You would still use this formula on that picture. And this is what people do. They put a number there, it's called epsilon zero. And if you do that, then the law, I'm going to write it down for, for, for later reference, it's going to be this. The electric field at a distance r from the big charge q is given by this formula. One mistake here still, and that is there, this is not a vector, right hand side, left hand side is. But I'm sure you can understand what I should do here to make it a vector, because what direction should it point, always. Yeah, or inwards, depending on whether it's Q is plus or minus. So it should be some radial thing, right? And in mathematics, we have the symbol for that. It's called R with a little hat. It just means radially outward, and it comes with no numbers. This has the length of one. So the only thing that this thing does is tell you in what direction it points. That's what the hat means, and makes it a vector. The actual strength is given by R squared. Now, you might wonder what this value is. And really that value has only something to do with how did we define our unit system, right? If we were to measure charge in different units than we usually do, then epsilon zero gets replaced uh, automatically by some other number. So the number is really just a unit artifact. In our usual units, I also get the power of that thing. So let me just look it up for a second because I always set it to unity. I choose my unit such that the thing is one. So when I don't, I have to look up what the number is. It's to the power of minus 14, but give me a second. Minus 12. You can easily read up what the unit is just by looking at the formula. So that's the whole idea. So this is all of electrostatics. The only thing you have to do, somebody gives you a bunch of charges, you calculate using Coulomb's law what the electric field is at a certain position, right? You get these, these, these lines over here. And if you want to know, if you bring an additional charge in, where that one will move, then plug your electric field that you found, you just plug it back into this equation here. It tells you the force, and if you know the force, then by Newtonian mechanics, you can calculate how it will accelerate and in what direction and such. So th this is really all that there is to it. So it's a very brief version of what electrostatics is about. Now in the second half, I'm going to expand on this, of course, because I'm going to write in mathematically different ways. But first, let's do a little little movie clip. I'm sure everybody has seen these kinds of things before, be it in real life or in experiments. But here's the idea. The situation that we saw here, where we have a plus and a minus, you can actually just make in a laboratory. Right? You have these kind of uh, generators and they pile up pluses and minuses at different positions. And what they did here in this video is they sprinkled this, some seeds, on oil. Now, why oil? Because oil makes it fluid. Right? So these things can actually move. Otherwise, friction would have prevented these things from moving. So the oil doesn't actually electrically do anything, just make sure you can see what's going to happen. Um, and these sprinkles are themselves electrically charged. Let's say they are pluses. 
So you make a big amount of plus here, a big amount of minus there, and if this whole field line idea is correct, you should see that all the plus seeds are being pushed in that direction. So if you have a little plus seed over here, then it should move from here all the way to there. Now let's see what happens. So it's actually a demonstration making visual of the electric field lines. Just proving that Faraday was right. It's an actual physical entity. It's not just a, a mathematical trick. It's a physical entity. Now give it time. They're piling up the, the charges. Of course, these things also have to get moving at some point. It takes a while. But maybe you can already see the lines forming. Zooming in. That's for me, by the way. That's a video. And there we go. Here's the lines. You have to see them forming. Over here, they're spreading out radially. And over here, they're turning into themselves. Question, why, why do they stop moving? I mean, these lines tell you where they should feel the force, right? And they keep on feeling force, so they should have not just have an acceleration, it should pile up. But they, they stop somewhere in mid oil. Why does that happen? In other words, why doesn't one of these seeds just move all the way to the, to the minus one and get stationary at some point? Not because of electricity. Practical issue. Yes. It's the oil itself. Oil stopping moving. Mm -hmm. Fluids are viscous, which means that they cool on itself. It's hard to push honey. <laughs> it's hard to make honey flow. It's also hard to make oil flow. Not as difficult as honey and less difficult than water, but it is still hard. So these little seeds want to be pushed by electric fields, but the, the, the oil that allows them to move in the first place at some point stops them, stops their movement, just because of the friction of the oil with itself. So it's a practical thing. Yes? So how would it look different if you would use water instead of water? Oh, I've actually done that experiment once in a, in a classroom setting. Uh, in fact, we didn't use water, we just used air. <laughs> we just had these two things, no oil, and these, 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 these somewhat charts of these poppy seeds, and I it over it and it exploded in everybody's faces. No, literally, because <laughs> um, two things. One of them uh, was, uh, uh, well, maybe three even. The electric force is ridiculously strong. So it really ex made these things just fly throughout the lecture room. That's one thing. Um, the, uh, the, the second reason is it goes out radially. Right? And one other nice thing that the oil does is keep everything in one place. Now the poppy seeds really don't care about this, about that plane. There's nothing, if nothing is there, keeping them on that plane. So they really exploded in all directions. And there was a third thing that I forgot. But uh, let me just say everybody got covered in poppy seeds, and I decided to next time just show it by video. But that's that, that's what happens. You you can actually see that these fields exist. It's it's not just it's not just a, a mathematical tool to calculate. Yes. Uh, I've seen some videos where they just do it with a magnet. Iron stick oh yeah, yeah. Around it and just make the yes, I will come to, to, the, to that exact video in a second when I'm going to talk about magnetostatics, but let me use that comment to make one extremely important distinction. There are people, and hopefully you're not among these, these people, certainly not the end of this course, uh, who think that electric fields and magnetic fields are sort of like the same thing, but they behave under completely different rules. The only thing that sort of makes them look the same is that they're both fields that tell how other things should move in what direction and that they can repel and attract. So that's really the, the thing that, that's, that makes people confuse these things with each other, right? I mean, there's a lot of people who say, well, you have a, a, a charge here, an electron, you have a magnet here, and they're supporting on each other. No, they don't. A charge does not feel an, a, a magnet. Mag magnets, magnetic field, charges don't feel magnetic fields. Magnets feel magnetic fields. 
very much the same way if I were, go, were to go back to this picture here and I hold a magnet here, it will not feel anything. It will not feel these lines because these lines work on charged particles and not on magnets. Magnetic fields and electric fields are very different. Of course, I'm going to counteract myself at the end of today's lecture when I'm going to say that these things are related to each other, but not a priori. <laughs> it's relativity that connects these things to, to each other. If you have no idea about that, then they're going to be extremely uh, separate things. Anyhow, speaking of magnetism, so back to the medieval guy. Guy has no idea about uh, other forces than gravity and maybe has just picked up the idea that there's also this thing called charge. And then you find that there's another way that particles or objects can attract or repel each other. And if history, my memory of history serves, then I think I found them this for the first time in Ors. I think it's some Greek island or some Greek place called Magnetos. Maybe somebody knows it better than me. You should look it up maybe in Wikipedia. But uh, this is where the name comes from. And really, this is old Greek guys who stood on some shore or something like that and found some magnetic ores. And they found, well, wait a minute, these rocks start pulling on each other. And if I flip one of them, they start pushing on each other. Okay, and they call it magnetism from that moment on. Now, just abstractly speaking, um, I'm just going to call magnetism the collection of phenomena in which the magnetic force plays a role. Okay. Um, just experiments. You do experiments, you see that some materials, call them ores, pieces of, of, of rock that you dig up from the ground, they attract each other or repel each other by a force that is not gravity and it's also not electro, uh, uh, electricity. One way of seeing that it's really not the same thing is that you can actually make the repulsive force into an attractive force just by taking one of these ores and flipping it 180 degrees. You cannot do that in this situation. There is no way, or this one, there is no way that you can do anything with this particular situation that all of a sudden makes arrows point the other way. Right? You can squeeze it, you can expand it, you can set fire on it, you can paint it green, doesn't matter. It will always be the same radial field. Whereas if this was a magnet, you can actually turn repulsion into attraction. You just flip one of the other guys around. So you can really tell it's a different thing. It's, it's something else altogether. So it's not electric. Realigning such objects, you can switch repulsion from attraction. And of course, this is the comment that I just made. We will see at some point that magnetic forces are really just electric forces in a relativistic disguise. And if you don't know what I mean by that, we will come to that, of course. That's exactly what this course is going to be about. But by the way, does anyone know how magnetic forces follow from relativity in electric forces? If not, that's fine. That's this, what this course is going to be about, which is out of interest. Is this like the impossible fusion? Yes. And it depends like on each one from, from you are. Yes. So you have like possible movement or not. That's the um, controversy that it's actually a magnetic field. Isn't it? I see, um, but okay. So suppose I only have electric uh, charges, an electric force, right? No magnetism. I have this charge here. I have this other charge here, and then you say one of them is moving. Yeah. Sure. And how do I? How? How? Where? Where does your magnetic field come in? Because they have an attraction. Say there's a yeah. plus and a minus. Say they have an attraction. So that's just electric, right? Where does the magnetism come in? It's crazy for you. Uh, I'm not sure, but like. Yeah, sure. I mean, of course, again, this is what the course is going to be about, of course, to see exactly how that works. But to give you some idea, again, these people did not know that, right, when they picked up these ores for the first time. But just to give you some idea, we're going to expand on this later on in much more detail. But suppose you give a wire here with the electrons in there, right? Okay. Uh, this thing has, a, has an electric field. All of them have these radio electric fields. So this whole thing, superposition, has this big electric field. Now this plus thingy comes around. If he's standing still, he just feels the electric field, combined electric field, and he's probably been going to be pulled inward. Right? Now your situation, suppose that we give, give this thing a push, moves with a certain velocity upwards, and then you take your relativity. And one of the things the special relativity tells you that if you are moving with respect to something, it will Lorentz contract. It becomes shorter. So if you're a moving plus particle moving in that direction, then all of a sudden this becomes a shorter thingy. Do you agree? But the amount of charge cannot change from one reference system to the other because charge is a conserved property. Or to be extremely puristic about it, it's a um, covariant property. It doesn't change from one reference system to the next. 
So that means for a moving particle, you have the same amount of charge in less space. That means you get an additional amount of electric field. This thing gets feels more field lines all of a sudden. And that gives it an extra push that it did not have when it was standing still. Now, by properly writing this down in mathematics, you would just find that's exactly the magnetic field that it feels. So magnetic forces or magnetic field lines are really just Lorentz contracted electric field lines. Of course, people had no idea back then. And if you don't understand this now or in quantitative detail, don't worry about it. This is what the course is going to be about. Back to the medieval guy. He just sees his new force, has no idea. Okay. Now, let's write down some formulas. Um, people found out that if you are this thing over here, the moving, forget about the Y here, just a floating electric charge, then they found that the amount of, L, uh, of, 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 of force that you feel, the not electric force, is magnetic force, has something to do with how fast you are moving, how much charge you have, and also this extra property that's now called magnetic field. I will show you the formula for the magnetic field in a second. You all know what this means, right? The cross product. You also know that it says, yeah, right hand rule and such. And you also know that, that it, it, it's always uh, perpendicular to both V and to V. This is another way of, of showing that it's really not an electric field. Forget what I said about relativity just a second ago. That it's really not an electric field. Electric fields pull things towards each other, whereas this thing pulls it in a perpendicular direction. So it's hard to, to see how an electric field is a magnetic field. Again, for these people, that meant it's really a different force. It even pushes in the wrong direction. Much as wrong as in the opposite direction, no perpendicular to that. So it's really a new thing for these people. Now, this is what people just found um, when they did the experiments. And you can play the same thing. You can write down magnetic fields for this. You can write down lines for these. I haven't shown you yet what the formula is for these lines. I'm going to show you later in more detail. I'm just going to show you the pictures first. And again, the magnetic field lines tell you in what direction other things are being pushed. tells you in what direction a positive charge will be pushed, but only if it's moving, because if it's standing still, it doesn't feel any magnetic pushes, it just feels electric. Now, and the same trick also applies here, that if you have the density of magnetic fields, the more magnetic field lines you pass have passing through your body, the stronger the field is for you. Now, what do these fields look like? Here it is. They're closed. Electric fields point outward, always. Magnetic fields always close in on themselves. They go back to the optic where they came from. Why? Let's call it experiments from now on. Right? This, is what, this comes out of the experiments. But it also allows you to identify what is the front end of a magnet and the other end of the magnet. Because you can actually tell in what direction other charges are being pushed from here to there and not the other way around. So that really allows you to identify that there's one side that is distinct from the other side. And we just by name call it North Pole and South Pole. Again, this is name calling. You can also call that vertical only if you want. North Pole and South Pole. I don't have to tell you, don't confuse this with plus and minus. There's also legions of people who think a North Pole is, is plus, like an electric plus. It has nothing to do with each other. North Pole, South Pole, pluses and minuses. So there you go, that's what magnetic field uh, lines look like. And yes, here's the presentation, that, that I think that's the one that you, that you saw before. Now, just an explanation. Um, what you have here is a side view of a little glass object, it's transparent. It's filled with oil and again with little seeds, but in this kind of uh, uh, time the seeds are uh, uh, shrapnel from this magnet, right? So there are all these little pieces of magnet in there. If I were to do the, the poppy seeds in there, uh, they would not feel the magnet because charges, stationary charges, will not feel magnetic fields. So poppy seeds will not work. They don't feel the electric field lines. But little magnets do feel the, electric, the magnetic field lines. So in a second, what we're going to do is we're going to slide a piece of magnet in from the side and then see what the little magnets do. Nothing happening. There's the magnet. It's North Pole and South Pole. It's a three-dimensional picture. You're looking at it from the side, and there you go. 
again. The oil's there to make sure that these things can move in the first place. And there you go. And they follow the field lines. It's, uh, you can actually see these things closing in. At some point, they don't anymore. And that's simply because the field gets to, to leak on the far distance. I will show you in a moment that this one, too, goes with the square of the distance. Um, question, just out of interest, see if anyone knows. Um, why do these not move from one side of the map, the North Pole, to the South Pole? And these also get stationary at some point, just like in the electric case. In the electric case, it was because of the friction, the viscosity of the fluid. Maybe the same reason? Different reason? Should you tiny magnets have their own north and south pole? Yes. So is that why, depending on which way they were in the oil, they never pulled them to the Exactly. They, they, the best thing they can do is flip. But there's also the viscosity argument. That, that still holds. But here's the thing. If I have this magnetic field here, north pole, south pole, then the lines, according to experiment, go like this, like these little onions. And suppose that magnets and cells come just with north poles, and, or south poles, and not just this always this combination of north pole and south pole. So I have a little north pole over here. And this one would move, because that's what the lines do. They tell you where north poles should go. Then this one would move all the way there. But this thing can, cannot just have a north pole, because in that case, its field lines have nowhere to go, and they should always close. So this thing has no choice but to have, have a south pole itself. And do you notice now that the north pole is being pulled by this bigger field line towards the left? The south pole is being pulled towards the right. It doesn't move at all. The best thing it can do is reorient it itself so its north pole is closest to the, to the field line and the south pole is closest to the field line. So the best thing it can do is just flip, orient themselves. So there's a reason why you don't see these things flying around. I can do this experiment safely in a classroom setting without everybody getting iron shrapnel in their faces, right? For that reason. Okay, good. So again, field lines actually do exist. So that's a nice thing. Now, demonstration that everybody, I guess, knows. The Earth itself, of course, has a North Pole and a South Pole, and our friends, the geologists, could probably tell you why that is. I'm not sure if it's a completely solved problem. Maybe somebody knows. I don't. I mean, I mean, it's a fact that the Earth has a North Pole and a South Pole. You take a compass and you see it happening. But the reason why that is, I think it has something with the you know, the iron core or something like that that's it's floating around or something. I'm not. I mean, this this is what I hear, but I'm not a geologist. Anyway, the fact that is these things exist. Of course, you know this, right? You take your compass and you can actually see that it's pointing towards the the field lines. So this is why you can tell. Again, imagine this medieval guy. He has this, this little piece of iron in this, this, this small locket that he has in his pocket. And for some reason or another, he sees that this thing always points to the same thing. I mean, that is like magic, right? If you have no idea about magnetic field lines. So I'm, I'm not sure how they wrap around their heads around that. And the nice thing is, um, at the moment that the sun bursts out these, these charged particles, and it does so every now and then, these charged particles go through these magnetic field lines, and we already saw the magnetic field lines do not affect stationary charges, but they do affect moving charges. So the sun bursts out these, 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 these particles, they come flying in here from the sun, they're moving charges, so they feel the magnetic field lines, they're being pushed in the direction of that thing, so all these particles go over here to the North Pole, or the other ones, the opposite charge go to the South Pole. And maybe you know from your electromagnetism course that if you have a, a charged particle that accelerates, it sends out light. Yeah, exactly. In fact, here's a nice video of that. I'm so happy, by the way, the video still worked when I transported, not just from system to system, but even operating system to operating system. So here's an actual, his actual footage. I mean, it sped up a little. But it was somewhere in the north. Maybe Finland or something like that. Here it is. It just happens to come out in green, that light. But this is really the fact that these particles, charged particles from the sun, get deflected towards the North Pole and or the South Pole, and over there you get accelerated, and where the acceleration is, is where they send out light. So uh, technically, I'm completely leaving that, it looks like uh, ballistic, but I have light 
Because they said, it said that they had uh, Mickey Gates or, or like the uh, oh. head back uh, head team. Yes. Yeah. So is it not in that specific area like in England? No, 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 not in the slightest. I forget what the number is, but you, you in medical physics you have these 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 units called the CFET that tells you how 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 badly a certain amount of, of charged particles going through your body affects your tissue, yeah. and it's some ridiculously small amount. Okay. Um, Why? Well, because it's already reacting with the uh, atoms. Uh, well, th that's that's certainly one of the reasons because it it's already has lost an amount of energy to make this light in the first place, mm -hmm. and well, as you know, green light will probably not not uh, not be have any effect on you, so the only particles that remain are very extremely low energetic. This is probably the reason why that number is so small. Now, of course, over here, you also have these charged particles, and they're also being accelerated by a field line. So, in principle, they also send out light here, but not as much, because the field line density is very small here. So, they don't feel as much force, right? The amount of density of line tells you how strong the force is. It's not as strong here, not a very dense amount of field lines, not as much acceleration, not as much light. So no issue there. So this is why you see it over there. Yeah. So what exactly determines the color of the light? Oh, oh, no, that is an interesting thing. Uh, the answer is quantum mechanics, <laughs> which is sort of a magic answer for every every <laughs> issue in physics, especially in theoretical physics. But it is the the the, the, the serious answer. It has to do with the, the the energy levels that these particles have in their surrounding medium, and the jump from one energy level to the other one is what determines the light. Anyway. Okay, so that's all very nice. We have magnetism now, electricity, separate entities in principle, right? We already saw some reasons why they could not at, at a priori have to be the same thing. One of them was one of that uh, the electric ones really cannot be turned, whatever you do to the situation, be, be turned from repulsive to attractive. That's one reason. The electric fields always uh, pull radially, the magnetic ones do not, they pull per perpendicularly. Difficult thing. So they look different. Then, of course, Orsett came along. Orsett in the 18th century did an experiment, or in the 19th century maybe, did an experiment, and he found that he could turn an uh, electric field into a magnetic field. He would actually turn one into the other. The way they did that was in the following way. He um, took this magnet here, he just wiggled it around. I think, I'm sorry, he did it with electric fields. I mean, it works both ways, so I'm struggling which example I should do first. Let's see this one. It lines up with my PowerPoint. If you have this charge here, it has an electric field, and you wiggle it around a little bit. Or, you could also do that. Don't wiggle it around in space, but just increase the amount of Q here, or decrease it. Just make a change in time. Now, if you're the guy standing over here with your test charge, if you wiggle this thing around, say you move it away a little bit, the density of charge of the field lines that you feel here has become smaller. If you move this thing back a little bit closer, the density has become bigger. So this guy over here is feeling a varying amount of field lines. Very much the same way, if you keep the thing stationary but just increase the amount of Q, you also increase the amount of field lines, you would also feel an increasing amount of density, or if you make it smaller, a smaller amount of density. Now, in principle, if you were just to believe this equation here, this Coulomb law, the only thing that you would have is just a changing amount of electric field. You could hold a magnet there, nothing would change. The only thing that would change, given what we know now, is that the charge that's over there feels less or more force, electric force, no magnetic forces whatsoever. But then Orsted, this guy, did an experiment, and he found that if he wiggled this thing around, and again, or increase maybe the amount of charge. Then all of a sudden, this situation gets a magnetic field from somewhere. No magnet inside, yet a magnetic field. The electric field still stays, by the way. So by wheeling this thing around, all of a sudden you go from just having an electric field to an electric field plus a magnetic field. Interesting question. If the, if the electric field is also still there, and you've also made a magnetic field, where does the energy go? You make an electromagnetic field all of a sudden, you have something extra. I mean, I'm, I'm, just by the gesture, I see, I see that you that you understand what, what the reason is. It was correct. Anyone? No, you know, you, you have the answer. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the guy doing the moving, it, it's his energy that's being supplied and it's being turned into a magnetic field. So that's nice. You can turn kinetic motion, energy, into magnetic field. So that's, that's nice. 
here's the thing. Here's the, the variety of the experiment that he did. What you have here is a wire. And a wire, as you know, consists of charges. And these charges make up an electric field. So this thing has an electric field and has charges. You will hold this next to the magnet. By the way, this is not a video of, of, of an actual footage of Urset. Nothing's happening. Why? Well, it's it, because the thing has a magnetic field. The compass and the wire is an electric field. They do not feel each other. But now he's going to make the electric field move in space. Why? Because the charge is going to move in space. It's going to be a current. It's going to attach to a battery. Note the magnet. There you go. Yes? If the current is uh, somehow oscillating, like the... Oscillating current. You know, like the AC instead of the yes. DC, then would uh, the magnet also switch on? Yes. 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 In fact, uh, uh, the equation for the magnetic field I removed already, but there was a V in there. And if you switch the sign of V because the current goes the other way, then the force is the other way. So in principle, yes, the, the, uh, uh, the handle, the needle of the magnet would switch. Also note, by the way, it's really a magnetic field because you can tell that the direction of the pushing that this new field does is perpendicular to the motion. Right? The motion is like this, but the needle goes like this, perpendicular to the motion. So you can really tell there is really a magnetic field happening there. But again, no magnet in sight. So Ursa discovered this just in his laboratory. And again, that means that there is some connection between electric fields and magnetic fields. If you find yourself at some deserted island lacking of magnetic field, but you happen to have a charge in your pocket, just wiggle it around and you have a magnetic field. I mean, it's, it's, it's as easy as that. It also works the other way around. I mean, that, that's, that's a question that, that, that's really now on the top of everybody's lips, of course. Uh, can you also wiggle a magnetic field around and make an electric field? And the answer is yes. You can also do that experiment. Don't have a video, but a famous example is a dynamo, of course. Right? The one that people used to have on their bikes. There's a little magnet in there with a north pole and a south pole. Uh, it gets rotated because of the cycling. Right? It's attached to a tire or something like that. So it gets, starts to rotate. So that means you have a fluctuating magnetic field. And if there's any symmetry in nature, maybe you would expect this to turn into an electric field. And it does. And you can use that electric field to make sure that all of a sudden electrons start moving through your wires and you have light in your back. In fact, this is how we get most of our electricity from our sockets. Somewhere in countries, they have big buildings where they have big magnets that they rotate around, either by nuclear forces or by heat and coil underneath it or something like that. And moving that thing produces an electric field with which you can then generate electricity that's, now, that's being sent to houses and, and buildings and institutes and such. So it works two directions. So there's a fundamental connection between the two, electric fields and magnetic fields. And it was Maxwell who put all these equations together, the four equations that are called the Maxwell equations. And you can actually already tell why there should be four. Right? Three laws of Newton, four laws of Maxwell. One of them you need to tell that electric fields point out radially. One of them you need to tell that magnetic fields close in on themselves. One of them you need to tell how magnetic fields turn into electric fields. And the last one you need to tell how electric fields turn into magnetic fields. And that's really the content of these four equations. These are the four Maxwell equations. Uh, forget about this. This is just a definition of uh, what Nabla means. Here they are. Let's go through them. In the, after the break, I will actually go through them, but now in mathematical detail. The first one. This one says, if you can read your mathematics, it says that electric field lines are being are produced by the amount of charge per cube. Right? Rho is the charge density. And it also says that they point out radially. That's what they both says. This one, the second one, tells you that magnetic field lines are always closed. If you know your mathematics, and the tutorial will be about understanding exactly why all of this is true, but if you know your mathematics already, then you know that this symbol, the nabla, in this particular combination, the divergence of a nabla with a vector tells you how much a vector is sticking out. And 
this case, it still says it's not sticking out at all. So it means the amount of lines that go out is exactly the amount of lines that go in. So in other words, in other words, all plus. This one says how many lines are sticking out. Well, it's proportional to the amount of charge there is. This is exactly the law that we saw before. Now, these, so these two tell you how the lines look. And this one tells you, well, if you have a magnetic field and you make it bigger or smaller in time, you fluctuate the magnetic field like you do in a dynamo, you get back an electric field by this particular combination. And then there's the last one. And it says, if you fluctuate your electric field, you have a time derivative of an electric field that changes in time, you get back a magnetic field. But there's an extra term. And the extra term says you can also make a magnetic field by having current, by making sure charges move through a wire. That's all we're seeing. This is all of electromagnetism. So in principle, this is a whole course that you did in electromagnetism, I'm sure. I mean, I wasn't there, I'm sure you learned all kinds of interesting things, but this is really the, it's the, the essence of it. The idea now is, take these four equations for a given situation. I, I tell you how many charges are, there, are here and how many magnets and how much they are flowing through, through space. Then by these equations, you can calculate what the electric field is at any moment in time and in space. What the electric field is at any moment in time and in space. And by using these two equations to tell you the forces, electric force, magnetic force, you can calculate how things will be. So this is all of electromagnetism. So that's that. Again, one big summary of electromagnetism. Now the plan, I'm not sure how we are doing on time. We lost some time at the beginning. So I propose that we reconvene in, say, 10 minutes or so, and then uh, we go to basically the same stuff, but now in more mathematical detail. That's the idea. Just some final comments uh, on this. Once you have these Maxwell equations, um, you can calculate all kinds of stuff in electromagnetism, except for quantum mechanical issues and some extremely technical relativistic issues. These will, these will give you everything about electric fields and magnetic fields that you care to calculate. Okay, again, the electromagnetism course was about how you go about doing that. That's not our object. Although I have included some exercises today to just give you an idea of how that works. So that's all fine. But just to give you some overview, this of course I guess you already know. But it's good to emphasize. Suppose you start out with this magnet here. And you wiggle it around. Then the wiggling of an electric field, uh, excuse me, a magnetic field, as you know now, produces an electric field. But if you wiggle it in just the right way, then you don't you just produce an electric field, you, you produce a wiggling electric field. Okay, so you have a wiggling electric field now, but the wiggling of the electric field, again, makes a magnetic field. So you go back to this one here, which again wiggles. So it switches between electric and magnetic, electric and magnetic. And you can calculate, just using the Maxwell equations, no other information needed, you can calculate that every time that the magnetic has wiggled to an electric, it has moved a certain amount of distance. And you can actually calculate how fast that flows through space. And this is what Maxwell himself did. He just took these equations, no extra information, put everything together, to, to calculate how much of the wiggling of its starting magnet, or charge, doesn't matter which one you start, how fast it wiggles through space, how much distance it travels per second. That number actually pops out. It's 2,998,000 uh, kilometers per second. And then he made the inference. It's not official proof, but he made the inference. He said, well, that is exactly what other people in my, my optic friends have calculated, measured, that, that, that what, what light is, how fast light travels through, through space. So he said, well, Maybe this wiggling of electric to magnetic back and forth, back and forth, really is just what is what light was all along. So he discovered what light is. Now, just having two things that go with the same velocity is not quite the same as saying they are they are the same things, right? I mean, if Chai and I were to walk here with the same distance, it's 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 a little superficial to say that he and I are now the same person. Okay, but of course you can do all kinds of other stuff with these equations as well. You take these. And then you can calculate, okay, given maybe that we have this proposition that this wiggling back and forth is light, 
then maybe all these other optical laws that we know from experiments should come out of these equations, and they do, all of them. So that includes the law of refraction, right? So Snell's law, so how much light or this wiggle of electromagnetic, how that shifts as it goes from one, from one medium to the next, comes out with exactly the right law. Also, the law of, uh, 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 what's, what's it called? I have no idea if the law has a specific name. But if the thing stays in the same medium, it just bounces off the surface, a smooth surface, and it comes out with exactly the same angle as that it went in. Yeah, reflection, that's what the word I was looking for. Thank you. It's refraction, that was the one I mentioned before, right? That's a Snell law. And reflection, that's the one. So that the angle with which it comes in is exactly the angle with which it comes out. Also comes out of this equation. Nothing needed from, 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 from other physics, just these equations. So all these things turned out to give you exactly all the properties of light, not just the philosophy. So it's, it's Charlie and I walking here, but all but both of us having the same height, having the same outfit. Already halfway there, I see, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and all the properties happen to be exactly the same thing. So Maxwell, I forget what the exact quote was. I don't know it verbatim, but he said something in his paper, I can scarcely... Uh, uh, escape the conclusion that light is just an electromagnetic radiation, something like that. And it's a beautiful thing. It really is beautiful. And now we know that this is really true. So how to envision this? This is a video. There's a beam of light. Here's the electric field goes up and down. And everywhere, we also have a magnetic field. And you can see where one of them is big, the other one is small. So it just go back and forth, back and forth. And that's light. So if, imagine, imagine now, back in the day, here's the medieval guy again, who rubbed the cat, uh, who rubbed the balloon, got some sparks, did some physics, or some experiments on that, right towards that, uh, the other guy's fair today, Franklin and such. There are some people in Greece, maybe, who picked up some, some rocks from the, from, from the ground, some, some ores. They found, wait, these two repel and attract each other too, do some experiments, blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden, you have not, not just found electric fields, magnetic fields. You found that they are quite the same thing. You can turn one to the other. And you have also uh, explained all of light, all of optics. I mean, th those are big discoveries. I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculously beautiful. It really is. So back to your desert island. You find yourself without a magnet, but you have a proton in your pocket, you wiggle it around, you get a magnet. Suppose that you're over there and, I don't know, you want to listen to your latest Spotify song or something like that, but your phone is empty, but you have a magnet in your pocket, you just wiggle that around, you, you get a current, you get an electric field. You can, in principle, charge your, uh, your phone, <laughs> in principle. And if you find that it's too dark to read, well, just wiggle it very fast in a very peculiar way, and you get a flash of light. Um, I have to say that the wiggling that you have to do, the amount, it has to be ridiculously big. Right? I mean, the, the frequency of, the, of different types of light is somewhere in the, in, the, in, the, in the megahertz or something like that. So you have to wiggle your magnet a couple of million or even billion times per second. But in principle, you're producing light. So that's very nice. Again, where does that energy come from? You make a flash of light by wiggling one of these things. There's light, so there's energy. So where does the energy come from? So it's again from the wiggling. You've turned your kinetic energy into electromagnetic energy, into light. So that's nice. Now, the biggest uh, application of all of this, of course, is, uh, uh, well, there's two actually. One of them is that if you know how to turn motion into electromagnetism, you can also do it the other way. And this, of course, is how we make our electrical engines. But every time your phone buzzes, it's because somebody found out, was Tesla in this case, how you could effectively turn a current, a moving electric field, back into motion, which is the buzzing of your phone, say. But also every, every piece of electrical toy that you've ever played with. Also, getting signals on your phone requires information to be sent via something, which is electromagnetic fields. That was Heinrich Hertz, who found out using Maxwell's laws that is wiggling but we now decide, you know what? I have this proton here, and I wiggle it about. And say, you're a proton too, right? So I wiggle this thing, turns to electric, magnetic, electric, magnetic, goes all the way to you. At some point, your proton will start to wiggle along with mine because it feels the wiggling of my electric field, right? That's what electric fields do. It, it wiggles protons, charges around. And if we now decide that this particular type of wiggling I call an A, and this other type of wiggling I call a B, 
and do this for all letters in the alphabet, I can send you messages. And of course, this is uh, uh, wireless communication that we have. So uh, very, I mean, extremely simplified, of course, but this is the idea. Heinrich Hertz came up with the, again, luminous idea that maybe this <coughs> wiggling we can use to send messages back and forth. And he actually did that in practice, and it worked. And now we cannot live without these things anymore. So I mean, not just from a theoretical physics point of view, these equations that combine electricity, magnetism, and light is not just important for physicists, it's also important for engineers and your everyday society. This is one of the biggest revolutions in physics. Anyway, so um, I say we go to some actual uh, mathematical calculations. So this of the introduction, this one on the note. going to marry these things together. Okay? And we're going to use Einstein to really show how these things go. Because all I've done now is said, well, you have one of these things, and it's because of experiment that we know that you can produce one out of the other, but special relativity tells you exactly why that should be true. And that's, this is again what this is going to be about. So this is our weeks. Week one, that's today, recap of electromagnetism. In two weeks, because we first have to call it a week, trust me, I'm not going to be in my strip bar when that happens. It's going to be a formulation of, uh, of um, the exact same theory, but now in not in fields, but in this other thing called potentials. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry. That's what the lecture is going to be about. Then Jakob will take over for uh, for uh, week three. He decides to do that. I do four. He does two. And Jakob will talk about uh, the advance of retarded potential. Is there anyone who knows what I'm talking about? Can I say that? Not the electromagnetism people. Cool. Okay. No, that's fine. Again, that's what the lecture is about. I will say this though, just very briefly, the wiggling that it is to make your proton wiggle along, along with me um, has some retardation in there. It takes time for my wiggle to arrive at, you, at yours. So that means you have, to man you have to manually build that in your theory, otherwise it doesn't work. So this is what Jacques is going to explain. Now in week four, there's going to be a, a midterm, that's on uh, Thursday, the Friday, and before that time we're going to do a recap of special relativity. Not the full theory, just enough what we need to put that into our theory. Then week five, I'm actually going to do that. I'm going to show you how to write everything that we already know using just special relativity in this one big formalism. And finally, this is Jaco again. He's going to tell you how all of this theory uh, fits into the rest of physics. And he's going to do it probably from a particle uh, physics perspective. That's, that's his area of expertise. And week seven, two months or so from now, that's when we plan those happens. Anyway, so that's the idea. Okay, let's see if we can, this should be easy. It's really just because the button says switch off projector, otherwise you wouldn't have known how to do it. All right, so uh, two things, uh, electricity and magnetism, we've seen the laws already, I'm going to write them down again, I'm going to do some mathematical playing around with them. In both cases, I will end up with two, uh, excuse me, three separate equations that really tell you the same thing. It's just each of these three have their application given certain, certain circumstances, even though it fits it, it's exactly the same. So two sets of three equations, one set for electricity, one for magnetism. And of course, we're going to start with electricity. Now, this is also the moment that, that, that I will ask you that if you find that there's some difficulty in the mathematics, please do tell me. That I, I, I've noticed that every now and then I make a mathematical step that is unfamiliar to people. And uh, I usually only pick up on that at the moment that I don't see, that I see that people don't understand what I'm talking about. So if you, if you see that happening, do tell me so we can spend some time with that to explain that. Okay. So here's the electricity part. And in a moment we will go to magnetism here. I'm going to use black, probably looks better on the video. Okay. Now again, electrostatics is very simple. If you want to know how a particular charge will move through space, you just solve this equation. Or better put, you calculate what the force is on that charge, you put this force into second law of Newton or something, or 
even special relativity if you know how to do that, and then just solve the dynamics of the system. Of course, that requires you to know what the electric field is. And this is just a piece of experiment. The electric field of one particular particle, already given for by the PowerPoint, but here it is again, is big Q divided by 4 pi epsilon 0 r. And if you recall, just this extra vector r that tells you what direction it, it, it points. Just to make things very explicit, what I'm talking about here is you have this big charge here, Q. It's making an electric field. It's given by this formula here. And if you want to know how this other charge is, happens to be flying around, feels this one. This is when you solve this equation. So R is the distance between where the big charge is and where the small charge is. So you calculate the electric field at the position of the small charge, then you put it into this equation, gives you the force. That's the idea. Of course, it's a very simple situation because we have exactly one big charge floating around, one big Q. What if you have two Qs? Q1 and Q2. Might be a plus and a minus, might be a plus and a plus, might be plus 50 and plus 4, but two different ch charges. That also means that you have two different R's. R1 and R2. The question is, what will the electric field be? The total electric field. I see you gesturing, but I'm not sure what you mean. <laughs> just add. Yeah, you just add them. But that's a superposition principle. Electric fields add up. Again, not trivial, but they do. That's what this experiment tells us. All right, so that's easy. So that means that, to be very careful here, So this is for the combined situation I'm going to write down now. It's Q1, 4 pi epsilon 0. Excuse me, it should have been squared there. Plus the other one. R2 squared. And there you go. That's it. That was, it really is that simple. Um, hmm. Suppose that you have capital N of these particles, all the different positions. And you have to be careful here now. Because notice that I haven't stated where these Q's are. Right? I just said there is a Q. I haven't said where it is. Over here, I didn't have to because I just placed this Q in the origin of my of my coordinate system. Now, if I have two of these particles and not the same position, then either one of them is in the origin or neither of them, but they're not both in the origin. So I have to be more careful with my coordinates. So I'm going to do it as follows. I'm going to say that charge one is at position. It's a vector of the position. At position one. But note now, and by the way, this thing is the position two. But note now, I cannot use this as R1 and R2 anymore. Do you see that these now are separate things? They're not quite the same thing. This is where this is where charge one is. This thing and this thing should denote how far they are away they are from each other, how far this charge is away from the test charge. It's a different object. So I'm being sloppy in my notation here, so I'm going to be more strict. I'm going to do it like this. The position of this one, Q1, I'm going to call R1 from now on. Vector R1. Okay? The position of this one, I'm just going to call R. With no indices. Then the distance between these two, well, I shouldn't call R1 because R1 is already the position of this one. The distance between these two is just this one minus that one. Do you agree? Right? The distance between two vectors is really just the difference between the two vectors. So that's uh, R one thing is going to be one, and the other one doesn't have an index. That's the distance between the two. 
And that's the one I need here because the one here at the bottom tells you what the distance is between a charge and the place where you happen to want to know the electric field. So let's rewrite this. This is going to keep. This is just R1, exactly as I called it. Right? This is Q1. And here what we should have is the distance between Q1 and where I want to know the electric field, which is R1. squared. That should be the correct expression. I look troubled. Yeah, I don't really get what the, the what is the first term uh, right after the epsilon naught we have? So we get, we get the difference. Um, is this a question of what it says here? As yeah, what it says, yeah. Okay, uh, uh, r minus r1. Yeah. Oh, that's r minus r1. Yeah, I'm sorry. I mean, it's, it's uh, apart from the physical content, is the notation clear to everyone? Now this one had only one purpose, and that is to, point, to tell you in what direction the electric field is pointing. Now the electric field, in this case, is pointing in that direction, yes? But this direction is also given by this factor here, the difference factor between the two. So that part here that tells you in what direction things are pointing should also be this thing. But I should make very clear to everybody, I'm only talking about in what direction it points. It doesn't add to magnitude, how strongly it does so. So the notation that I'm going to use for that is going to be big R hat. You have to be extremely careful with the notation here because you very easily get confused about what things mean. So let me go over it one more time. This R means where is the Q, Q1. R without any index means at what point do we want to calculate the electric field. Coulomb's law tells you you should take the distance between these two points squared. Now the distance between this point and that point is exactly R minus R1 squared. That's what is here. And you have this part that tells you what direction it points. And that one, the direction one, I call capital R1. That's what I mean. So I've now doctored up the first term. I also have to do it with the second one, of course. But it goes extremely the same way. So Q2, that's over here, its position we call R2 vector. So its position that R2 vector. Coulomb's law tells us that in the denominator squared should be the distance between the two points. So this one, excuse me, that point. So that's r minus r2 squared. Right? This number is just the distance between these two points. And then finally, what we need is something that tells us in what direction this particular field is pushing. And that is this direction, which I denote by capital R2. That's my notation. Yes? Like for where you use the, the big R's, isn't that the same thing like the R1 with the hat, the big one? Isn't it the same as the small R minus yes. Uh, R1? Yes, no, it is. So why couldn't you just denote it as R minus R1? We could actually do that. I mean, uh, you're very right. I mean, the only thing that this thing is, is really just uh, this vector yeah. in total, mm -hmm. but with length one. And it's because of the length one that I decided to give the, it's an additional name. But you know what? Let's actually do that. It's, it's, a good, it's a good idea. Well, maybe we have too many different types of R's here, okay? So I'm going to write down the exact same thing. I'm just going to make the notation maybe a somewhat more clear. So this all remains the same. 4 pi epsilon 0. I will keep on calling this R1 with the hat. And this one, you're right, is just R. But I have to do the squared. But now, without the hat, because it has now it does not have length 1. Right? This one is actually the actual distance. It's the same expression. It's just I'm doing away with all the different types of R's now. Maybe that's a good idea. Now, in the same way, the 2 also works. The 
state notation, two squared, two hat, exactly. And, and that, that's what we have. We did not have this issue with only one R because we could very safely just put the Q in the middle of our origin and this R would, the, would have been the distance. Now you can easily generalize this of course because if you have a capital N amount of charges and they all just superimpose to get you the total amount of field, you would just get this. In this new notation that we <laughs> just a second ago defined, it should be like this. This is just a sum of all the possible n different types of charges. So that's nice. So that means that now you can do a calculation that if I just throw an amount of these poppy seeds all over with a charge, right? These exploding ones that you put in a lecture room and everything, and ask you what is the total amount of field at a certain position, you need to do this summation and you get everything. So this is all very nice. This is just summing up this law. Okay. Now Suppose that we have a situation where you don't have separate pieces of charge scattered here and there, but you have this continuous amount of charge. Now, of course, people who come from either particle physics or quantum mechanics know that you cannot have such a thing. It's always discrete. But if you look at it from enough distance, it looks like a continuous thing. So uh, any ideas on how to make this into a continuous Sum. It's a mathematical question more than a physical one. Yeah, yeah you make it an integral, of course. So you know this, right? I mean, the, the limit of a summation is by definition an integral with its own rules and such. So it just becomes an integral. What are you integrating over, by the way? Integration, there's also dx or d, d something. What is the d something? Yeah, I guess you could do that. It wasn't what I was going for, but I guess you could do it like an R, right? I mean, if you go through all through the R's, you will get past all the Q's that you encounter along the way. Which are the total of? That is a good question. I would, I would make it a capital R in our notation. Right? I mean, if you, it just means that you go from this one position where you keep your test charge, you go to all, well, let's say you're all piece of charge, and I'm the test charts and small q, you're all the combination of big q's, right? So what I just do, I just sweep my vector along u and u and u and u and u and u and then add everything up. So if I just make sure that I, I do this throughout all space, then I've made sure that I've had everybody and I know your total amount of field on me. But actually, let's do that because uh, how about we do this? I'm really doing the same thing now. What I'm doing now is I'm summing all over your Q's. Uh, that's another way of doing the, the exact same thing. Instead of just going throughout all space and then as I go along I get all of your Q's, I could also just pick every Q by hand and then I also get all the relevant R's. It, it's really the same thing. Instead of summing over Q's, like I did with the sum, I'm now integrating over all Q's. But let, let's make it into an integration over R's. So we can easily do that because dq for my epsilon zero R, uh, what we can do is let me say dq right. and by big V I mean volume just integrating over all space, and then I get the situation that you suggested, that I go through all space and then I pick up the cues as I go. And the picking up the cues is exactly this, this. Because if you read this carefully, it's the charge density, the amount of Q per volume. In fact, there's a name for that. It's called rho. How many charges is there in a cubic meter of space? Of 
course, it does depend on R. So this is no R because there is a different amount of Q at every point in space, at every vector. There's a small amount of Q here. At this particular point in space, there's more Q, and there's an enormous amount of Q over there. So apparently, the amount of Q that you encounter at a certain piece of space depends on where you are, where you're looking. So rho depends on R. The vector R, not just distance, it's point in space. And uh, I just integrate over the volume. I go through all the volume. At every point in space, I see how many Q there is via the density. Then add everything together, I get the total amount. Again, it's the same rule, just superposition of the original one, but it's an enormous amount of superposition. It's an integral, but that's the idea. Now, in fact, this is one of the three equations that we were going for. I'm going to tell you three equations for each situation, electromagnetic, and this is one. So let me put it up there for Viewing pleasure. If you want to know the amount of electric field at a certain position R in space, what you do, you sweep over the area, pick up the Q as you go along via the charge density, and then do this integration. So I was using the, still the R hat to tell you in what direction at this point. So I forgot that. This one. Yes. That R hat is a box or what? That's wrong. It should be squared. Yeah. It should be squared and here should be an R hat. Mental note. Maybe use a PowerPoint for, for the equations anyway. So I don't make mistakes. Hmm. Now just to be ridiculously careful about the different types of R that we're looking for now. Remember that a second ago we defined R, vector R, as R, the place where we are looking, minus where the integration happens to be, where our sweep is at that moment. Now the sweep R I'm going to call R with a prime. It's, it's what used to be Ri here. Which R is this? The one in our integration, in, in our in our charge density. I mean, I just wrote R, but which one is it? This R is where we are looking, as in where we are standing and where we where we would like to know our electric field. And the integration should be over all possible positions in space which, if I like a better word, I will call the sweeping R. Which R should I, should I use inside my charge density function? Should it be the R at which I'm already standing? No. Because I'm not interested in, in the amount of charge here. I'm interested in the amount of charge over there as it affects me. It should be this one, the prime one. The prime one is the one where I happen to be looking throughout my integration. So this is with all the notation completely correct. This is what it is. So be careful. Capital R itself depends on this one, the integration R. It's, it's going to be important for the next step. So this really, what we have here, is called Coulomb's law for charge densities. So far so good. Because I'm going to erase all of this I'm going to continue with this equation. This is the first of the three. The second one we will find at the moment that the second one we will find at the moment that I'm going to take the divergence of this thing. 
pure interest. Do you all know what a divergence is? The mathematical operation of taking a divergence. You don't? No? Sort of ish. Okay, so it's about 50 50. Okay. Okay. Do it like this. Um, I'll just, de just define the thing for you first, and then I'm going to continue with that. There are some mathematical steps in there that I've made as exercises, as in show that, given that you know what the divergence is, how then this next step follows. So if you don't follow every step, that's because some of them are exercises. But here's what a divergence is. It's really just a definition. Suppose that you have a vector, it's called M. It doesn't need to be a force, could be a force, just some random vector. As you know, a vector consists of three parts. You know what? For the sake of argument, let's call it a force. And it has three components because I can be pushed in three directions. It can be pushed forwards. Let's say this is x direction. Then my x amount of pushing is fx. I could also be pushed to the side. Right? This is y direction. That's this number. I could also be pushed up and down. That's z. So this thing is just a collection of three different numbers. And each one tells you something about a direction, what happens in, in that particular direction. Now, as you know, you can take derivative of things, how much it changes. Now, in case of a, uh, an object in, in physics or mathematics that has only one component, like temperature or something like that, uh, taking derivative is very simple. You just take derivative of that thing. Right? This is calculus. But if I take derivative of this thing, do I take derivative of this one, or that one, or that one, or all three at the same time? I get three different numbers. What should I do with these three different numbers? There's multiple ways of interpreting what you mean by a derivative here. Again, temperature, which has only one number, namely 25 degrees Celsius or so, has only one type of derivative. It either increases or decreases. That's the only thing that can happen to it. But if we're talking about force, or say my position in space, one derivative tells me how much I'm moving in x direction, but some other type of derivative tells me how much I'm moving in y direction, and I could also take a derivative that tells me how much I'm moving in z direction. So just by the fact that you're now three numbers, you have multiple types of derivatives, derivatives that you can take. It turns out in physics that one of the types of derivatives that you can take is called a divergence. Now, why this particular combination happens to occur in physics a lot has deep meanings. We're not going to talk about that. We're just going to define what it means. This thing is a type of derivative of a vector with a very, very special definition. This, by definition, means take the first thing, the first component, and take its derivative with respect to x. So take d dx this one. Then what you do is you take this thing, the y direction of your vector, take the derivative with respect to y. Gives you dy of f1. And you take the third component in z direction and take its derivative with respect to z. It's called dz of this one. So you have now three derivatives. Every derivative, for every component, you take derivative in, in, uh, with respect to the corresponding direction in space, and then you add these three functions together. This is by definition what is meant by a divergence, which is what the thing means. So there you go. So what's the thing? <coughs> like, you have the list of the Maxwell's equations. Yes. And the thing at the bottom of the yeah. Uh, when I when we uh, looked at the Maxwell e Maxwell equations before, uh, this one appeared a couple of times. One time, if you recall, I switched off the, the screen. But uh, in two of these equations, you had a divergence of a magnetic field and you had one of the electric field, and gave you some number. The magnetic field was zero. An electric field that says something about the charge density, if you recall. There was also two other equations that also included this, this thingy here, but it was yet another type of derivative that I haven't introduced just yet. It's called the rotation, but that, that will come in a second. 
Anyway, this is divergence. Note that even though you started with a vector, the divergence is a number because you've taken the three components and you've added them together with some derivatives. So what comes out is not a vector anymore, it's just a number. So it's like you start out with a force and you end up with a temperature. Okay, that's a crappy, crappy example, but when you end up with something that has three directions, you end, up, you end up with something that has zero directions. That's just the definition of the thing. Again, why this is such an important object in physics has deep reasons, which we will touch upon just a little, but just accept for, the, for a moment that it is there. But then again, it, you do know why it's important, because some actual equations, which tell you something about nature, have these built in there. So nature has picked out that this is an important thing. And it's a genius of these people like Maxwell who decided, you know what, uh, I actually can see through the laws of my experiments to see that apparently this is the key object, this is the key derivative to work with. Now back to my situation here. Here's a vector, and just for masochistic purposes you can decide, you know what, uh, might as well take the divergence of that factor. Why not? Why wouldn't you? But, okay, why on earth? You could also take its, its, log, its logarithm and then take the derivative of that and then take the tangent of that thing. Sure. Uh, it, it, it so happens if you take divergence, you end up with this very useful mathematical law. It's the same information because it's just this thing written in a different form. It's just that this new form is more helpful for some situations. So here it is. Take divergence. All right, well, let's do that. I haven't done anything, I've just wrote down divergence left and right. right. It's just this law, then left hand side I put this divergence thing, I also put it right hand side. Now, it's where the mathematics starts. Um, the integration is over the volume that I sweep over. The derivative of this thing is with respect to x, y, and z, but is with, with respect to my x, y, and z, the guy standing at position r. The integration is not over that volume. It's not over this guy's coordinates. And if you know your mathematics, your integration, then you know the following, just very simple mathematics. Suppose that you have a function x and y that depends on x and y, two numbers go in, and you integrate only over x for some reason. And then I ask you to take the derivative of this thing with respect to y, excuse me, with respect to x. Because this x is not the same as that y, you can get the uh, derivative inside of the integral. They're over different coordinates. And then calculus tells you that the integrations are and uh, derivatives are not with respect to the same coordinate, you can just switch them around. They don't feel each other. And this is what's happened here, because this thing is derivatives with respect to this r, not the volume r that I'm looking for over. So that means that I can take the divergence inside the integral, but more than that, question, very suggestively put, does this thing feel that derivative? You can tell by the tone of my voice what the answer is, but can you see why? The answer is no. Right, this thing goes inside the integral, then it encounters this thing, say. Does it feel it? It's for the same reason as why you are able to get the divergence inside the integral. Namely, the integral was over the sweeping arm, but the derivative is, is, is with respect to my arm. They're different variables. Here, the same thing. This thing depends on the sweeping arm, but not on my arm. 
derivatives is, is with respect to my r. And a function that does not depend on the thing from which I'm taking the derivative, you must feel the charge. And I'm saying something very simple here. Dx is both of two functions. One that depends on y and one that depends on x. Let's take the x derivative of this whole thing. Do you agree with me that the dx does not feel that one? As far as the derivative is concerned, this is a constant because it does not depend on, on x. So this derivative will just fly through the f without doing anything with it. It will, of course, do something with this because this one does depend on x. It's the same type of reasoning. So this is just a very simple thing. Same type of reasoning I'm using here. This one is looking for something that depends on r to take a derivative of. This is not r. This is the sweeping r, not my r. This is looking for r derivatives, not sweeping r derivatives. So it will not feel, just like here, fy, derivative will fly through it, will not feel it in the, at all. Same happens here. This derivative does not feel that one, just flies through it. But now it encounters something that does depend on my r. Remember this big capital R here? That depends on the R with which I'm with respect to which I'm taking the derivative. So I have to take the derivative now. Or the divergence of that thing. Then dv. This is why it was so important to really distinguish which types of R's are in my equation so you know what the divergence tries to touch and what, what it doesn't, what, what it flies through and what, where it doesn't. Now we come to a mathematical exercise. Given that you know what this thing means, here's the definition. And given that you do have a vector here, it's a complicated vector, right? Here's what's called capital F and here's r hat divided by r squared and such. But this is a calculation you can do, just to find out what it says. I'm going to give you the answer. This is one of these mathematical steps that I think is best if I just tell you what comes out. You're free to try it for yourself. What comes out is the following. 4 pi, that's not all. It just, let's sink in for a second that for some reason 4 pi comes out. Maybe you can understand why. Anyone wants to take a guess? Radius divided by radius to the power of two. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, notice that this thing does not depend on angles, right? It's only It only depends on how far away you are. So that means it should look the same everywhere around the sphere of, cap, of, 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 of capital R. The sphere is area of 4 pi. And this is where 4 pi comes from. But now comes the complicated part. Has anyone ever seen one of these before? Good thing that we're here because the course will depend on steps like these. Let me write down the name, see if you recognize it by name. It's called the Dirac. Yes, that Dirac, the part of this is Dirac. Dirac delta function. It is an extremely important function in mathematical physics. Now, don't worry if you don't pick up on these things. I sort of guess this in advance, so I've made a couple of exercises that let you go through these steps. Let me tell you what this function looks like. Here's a Dirac function of x. Now, you know how functions work, right? You put a number in, a number comes out. So for every number that you come across here in x, it gives you its own number. Here's what the Dirac delta function looks like. One of my favorite functions in mathematical physics. Here we go. <clears throat> zero. So every time that you put some number in, the rock delta gives you zero back. Zero, 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 zero. Infinity. Zero, 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 zero. <laughs> it's everywhere zero except at 
when you put zero in. Every number that you put in gives you back zero, except when you try to put in zero itself, it gives you infinity. And, and, and then ask yourself why this is true, <laughs> okay? Now that's not all, the Dirac delta function has a very interesting mathematical property, I will just give it to you. The Dirac delta function has the following property. Suppose that you put it underneath an integral sign, some random function, doesn't matter which one it is, and then you put the delta function there, oh, me. sorry, 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 x, Suppose that you want to do this. Some, some random function x, you multiply it by the delta function and you integrate this whole thing. Now, the delta function just puts everything to zero, doesn't it? <laughs> so it gives you zero times some number, f. Well, one x further away gives you again zero times f, zero plus zero plus zero plus zero plus zero plus zero, plus zero except when this thing itself is zero. x minus y is zero, so when x is y. Then this becomes infinite, okay? Into infinite amount of times a number. So you would guess that the answer is infinite, right? Zero plus zero plus zero plus infinite plus zero plus zero plus zero. Outcome is it infinite? It isn't. The outcome is a function, but now with x replaced by y. It, it, it's 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 ridiculously esoterical function, the dark delta function. And nature has decided that it's avoids it everywhere she can. Now at this moment I can only ask you to accept that this is the case. The only thing I've done now is I've said, well, this strange divergence that you're calculating here gives you 4 pi times this delta function. You have to accept it as a mathematical fact. There's an exercise that, that guides you through it. If you don't understand the exercise, don't worry too much about it. You just need the property. So it's an historical property, but we're going to use it. So we might as well just know it by heart at some point. You've written down that the Dirac delta is to the third power? Yes. What is? No, it's, uh, that's notation. What it means is that the number that you put in is not just an x. It's an x, a y, and a z. Okay. So it's not it's not to the third power. Yeah, thank you. This is one of these these blind spots that I have that I sort of write down, I assume everybody knows what I'm talking about. So thank you. Please keep asking these questions. This does not mean Dirac delta to the third power, it just means Dirac delta function in which you are allowed to put three numbers. A vector. This is a vector, right, that you put in. All right, what now. Does it, what does it look like in three dimensions? Uh, well, that means, okay, here's a space. Suppose that this is, this is zero, okay? We're going to Dirac delta our way through the space here and see how much comes out with every place where I am. So right here, the outcome is zero. And then over here it's zero as well, and over there it's zero, and everywhere it's zero, except the origin mode right here, right? Except when I stand here, then I go to, then all of a sudden infinity comes out. See this temperature, say. A function that tells you what the temperature is at every point in space. Well, it's zero here, chilly and such. It's chilly here, it's chilly over there, it's chilly over there, everywhere it's chilly, except exactly this point here, it's infinitely uh, hot. It's a strange function, but it's there. This is one of the exercises to see if you can understand why this is. I really want to stress if you find this too difficult or you don't grasp why this is true, that's fine. You're not going to need it, but you do need this property. So you have to remind, remember yourself, remind yourself how this works. Given that this is the case, can you not tell what this integral will give us using this property that you have here? Let me write down the integral first. Put everything put the four pi's cancel each other out. Epsilon zero rho r. Delta squares. Just clean up the four pi's, that's all that I did. And then the other R? Which R? 
one that it didn't originally <laughs> depend on? I don't remember if it was R dash. No, Stephanie, I think you're right. Um, yeah, you are right. But for everybody, the one easy way to remember this, what it did our delta does, it just replaces the other function by whatever is needed to make this thing zero. Okay, look, look what you see happening here. What you need to do to make the argument of the Dirac zero is set x equal to y. That's how you get zero within the Dirac. And then the trick is, what comes out of the integral is exactly this function with that thing that you needed to make the Dirac zero. And that's what we're doing here. What we have to do here, the Dirac delta tells as well, what will come out here is exactly capital R when it is zero. That's this property here. You have to put into the rest of the function exactly what was needed to make the Dirac argument zero. Now, to make this Dirac argument zero, you have to make capital R, R equal to zero. Yeah? But capital R equal to zero means that these two R's must be the same number. So that means that this R can now be replaced by the other R, and I think this is what you said. So no magic going on here except for this strange historical Dirac delta function, but what it does, it just takes a function that you already had and replaces all the R primes with the other R. Here's where we are. Collecting everything, what we get here is this equation. I'm sure it doesn't help you in the slightest, right? Now, I think this one is pretty obvious for everybody. I mean, it took us a while to interpret what it says, but it's really just summing the amount of charge everywhere and seeing of each of them how it influences me at this point and then calculating what comes out. The only thing I've done here is did some mathematical steps. So it's really just the same equation, just written in a different form. Now, why on earth would you write something that's completely understandable into something that is not as much understandable. <laughs> and it, 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 the answer is, it, it just depends on the situation that you happen to, to want to calculate. Suppose that I give you how much charge there is in volume, so I give you rho, the charge density, and I want to know how much, how strong the electric field at a certain position is, I use this equation. You give me rho, I do the integral, I know how much E there is at a certain point. But we all could also have the opposite situation. Suppose Chris comes in and he just feels a certain amount of electric field and he wants to know, wait a minute, but how much charge is there in this room? It's the opposite exercise. You start with a field and you want to know the charge. Then you can use this one because if somebody tells Chris the field, he just does this divergence thing over there and it gives, his, and it gives him back exactly what the charge is at every point. So these are opposite uh, mathematical operations. This one gives you E when you know what the charge is, and this one gives you the charge when you know what E is. So if you want, from now on, you, you can forget these steps in between. You now have two equations that tell each other how they work. They're just opposite equations. It's like a logarithm and, 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 and an exponential, or a derivative and an integral. In fact, it's, it's a lot like that, actually, because it's an integral and here's a derivative. It's, it's really just the same thing. So, again, if you don't understand how this works, don't worry about it. This is the physics. Now, which one do you use? Again, depends on the exercise. If the exercise is, I want to know the charge, well, use that one. If somebody tells you, I want to know the, the field, use the opposite, the, the one on the, in, in, on the top. There's that. This, by the way, is one of the four Maxwell equations. I showed you four of them, and the first one was exactly this. And what I hope that I've conveyed to you now, bar some mathematical steps, is that the original Coulomb law is really just Maxwell's first law written in a different form. So they're not two separate equations. If you have Maxwell's first equation, you also have Coulomb's law. If you have Coulomb's law, you have also Maxwell's first equation. It's just the same thing.
one more. I promised you three equations. We have two of the three now. Yeah, again, it's exactly the same information, just written in a different form that might be useful for particular situations. I'm going to erase everything except for the two conclusions that we have. Now, the starting point again is completely random. Why would you take the divergence in the first place? Well, apparently it gives you a very nice rule in the end. I'm going to use one of these other and just going to start randomly and then up with a nice rule. Suppose that I take this one and I'm going to integrate this over all of space. Okay, sure, why not? So take this law, Maxwell's first law that we've now derived. zero, and I'm going to integrate this thing over all of space. Now, that's allowed, if, but if I'm going to integrate left-hand side over all of space, I should do the same thing with right-hand side. So this, this equation, I put an integral on both sides over all space. You see this. Now, I hope you see that this is the, the right-hand side is a particularly easy integral. Epsilon zero is a constant, yes? So constants, as you know, just go outside of the integral, no issue there. I'm going to ask you very suggestively, right, the amount of charge per volume, and I'm integrating over all volume. What should it give me? The total amount of charge, of course. I mean, an integral is just counting, right? It just counts how many charges per cubic meter, and counting all the cubic meters gives you the total amount of charge. Well, divided by epsilon zero. And the total amount of charge we always call capital Q. To be very explicit, before capital Q were little point charges, of which you had many, and then that made the total amount. I mean the total amount now. This whole jelly of all the small charges. So the right hand side is useful. I hope you see now that there was a point in integrating this stupid equation because it gives you something that gives you the total charge, right? Which is a number you can measure in experiments. So it was useful to do this integration. We're not quite there yet because we still have to evaluate the left hand side. The right hand side is completely done and I hope uh, that I've given you some idea that it was useful to do that. Yeah. leave it like that, but we can do a nice little trick there. Electromagnetism people, something like this look familiar? The, the mathematics, not so much the fact that there's an E. So I see you nodding along, so. Yes. The divergence theorem. Is, are there people who are not aware of the divergence theorem? It's fine if, 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 if you're not, just want to make sure. Yeah, where, where, where did you pick that up? Okay. Okay, but I, I hear I hear people nodding along. That's fine. I'm just going to give you again what it is. The proof of this theorem is not particularly complicated, but it takes a while to go through. So again, I'm just going to postulate this is true. Feel free to look it up. It's in every book on vector calculus. It's an extremely important theorem. I'm going to put it here on my little notepad that tells us about how divergences work. Again, this is the definition of the divergence, and using this definition, you can prove the following theorem. It's called the divergence theorem. So this is definition. What now comes is a theorem that you have to go through the mathematics and prove. It says the following. If you have a divergence of this vector f, dv, and Sophie, what is it? I mean, you, 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 you nodded along, so that means at the very least you recognize it, but you also know what the outcome is. Yeah. 
this. Is that the one? Bar notation, maybe? Right. Let's talk about this for a second. Okay. Right hand side, or excuse me, left hand side is just uh, divergence which have integrated over all space. Doesn't matter what f is. In my example, it was a force field. Over there, it's an electric field. Doesn't matter. It works for all vectors. According to the divergence theorem, it's equal to another integral. But note that the, that the, that the divergence has gone. It's gone away. And note that you're not integrating over volume anymore, but over something called A. It's the surface of the volume, of the original volume. So here's the idea. I wish I had brought my beach ball, but suppose you have a beach ball. And one thing you can do is integrate over all positions within the beach ball. Every point in the beach ball, you calculate what the number is, and you add all these numbers together. That's a volume integral. The divergence theorem tells you, oh, what you can also do is not take all the points in the ball, just take the points on the surface of the ball. Only calculate those numbers. Add these together, and it gives you the same answer. That's what the theorem tells you. That's literally what it says here. Look, it says, instead of calculating all the numbers within the ball, the volume, you can also just calculate the surface of the ball, the numbers there, and add those together. There's a little circle here in the input side, and that means you have to do every point on the surface. You cannot leave it open. Right? It's not like a mover's box without a lid, and you just calculate the integral of all points of everything except the lid. It has to be a closed box. Everything has to be closed. That's what this means. So you can replace a volume integral by a surface integral. It does cost you something. You lose a divergence. This is a mathematical trick. If you prove that this is true, it's in all vector calculus books. Again, this is not one of the issues we're going to worry about. We're going to take it as fact. Back to our situation. Now look what we have here. It's a volume integral of a divergence, just like here. So that means we can replace this thing by an integral over the, over the surface. So let's first just write down the mathematics and then see if we can interpret it uh, physically. So according to the divergence theorem, this is not a smiley, it's an arrow that points downward as in it follows that. It's the same thing as if you took the electric field without the divergence, that one you have lost, and integrate over the surface instead of the volume. And according to what we saw before, this should equal the total amount of charge within the volume divided by epsilon zero. And this is the third equation that we were looking for. Again, it's exactly the same information as the other ones. Right? We started out with this one. We did some mathematical tricks, got that one, did some more mathematical tricks, now we get this one. So it's all the same physics, it's just written in a different mathematical form. Now for the interpretation. Who dares? Okay. Um, that's okay. Uh, the answer is yes, but what does that mean? Yes. 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 Exactly. Look what it says here. You take your beach ball, right? I mean, you were all charges, and instead of just going sweeping through this volume and picking up how much charge each and every one of you contributes, I could also just take the walls of this classroom, calculate how much of each of your electric fields are sticking out of the walls, because that's exactly what this says. It says, go over all the walls, not the volume, just the walls, see how much electric field is at, at those places, how much electric field is sticking through every wall, and then it says, oh, that's just equal the total amount of charge in, in the room. Does that make sense to you physically? That the more charges are in here, the more electric field is going to stick out. That's all that it says. So we have three times the exact same law, but in different, different mathematical form. This is extremely clear. Um, the upper one again tells you if somebody tells you how much charge there is, density, 
and it starts with per position, you want to know the electric field, you take the first one. Chris comes in and he wants to know, um, uh, he's given the electric field and he wants to know how much charge there is. You take the one at the bottom. And if for some reason you feel like only integrating over an area, the walls instead of the whole volume, you take the one in the middle. And you get the same answer in all cases. I hope the physics is extremely clear. Again, the first one the physics says, if you want to know the total amount of electric fields, just add all the electric fields per person. That's what the first one says. What this one says is, I told you before, this is the amount of sticking outness here. How much electric field sticks out depends on how much uh, charge density there is. If you want the total amount of charge, just add all these together. Look how much there is sticking out in the total amount of wall. And that's all there is to it. By the way, for the magnetic field, what would this be? This one. Just by zero. zero. But do you know by heart or do you know by? Because it's closed. Yes, because it's closed. The sticky outness, every, every piece of uh, magnetic field that's sticking out obviously should come back because they're always closed. So we can already tell in advance that it's going to be zero, but we're going to prove that later on. If you mathematically prove that that is the case. So these are the three that we wanted. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's being registered. Oh, really? Yeah. Nope, still recording. Yeah. Just so you know, I've I've recorded everything that everybody said during the break, okay? Yeah. Uh oh. Uh oh. I'm not saying that your grade depends on it, but <laughs> So indulge me just for a second more. This all of electricity. Again, electromagnetism or electrostatics is very simple. If you want to do electrostatics, well, mathematically it might be difficult, but in principle it's very simple. Somebody tells you how much charge there happens to be floating around in space, smeared out via some charge density distribution. You calculate via one of these three formulas what the electric field is at every point in space, plug it back into here, and you know how, how other charges will move due to that charge density. And then you do Newton's laws and such. That's all there is to it. The rest is just mathematical detail. Now, for magnetism, you can play the same game. We know what the formula is for the force. So if somebody has told you what V is, the magnetic field, then you know how a moving charge, which flies around with velocity V, how that will feel force, plug that into Newton's second law, you can calculate how that part will move. Of course, I, you will have to find out first what the magnetic field is. You have to have a function for B in order to put it back into here, get your Fs, and then do mechanics. Now, in the PowerPoint presentation, I did not show you what that formula was for the B field. So this is the first. So how do you get the B field? First of all, let's get the notation straight. Um, the B field itself is a vector, it points into a direction, right? The arrows point into some direction. Uh, it depends on where you are in space, where you happen to be looking, that's R. And here it is. It by itself is an integral. It's very much like this one, it just happens to be somewhat more complicated. In one thing that is the same is that it depends on R squared, just like that one. Let's be very clear here. This R is going to be the same type of R as that one, capital R. And just like the electric field equation, Coulomb's law tells you in what direction the magnetic field points via R hat, this one also depends on R hat. So in that sense, it's exactly the same. So there's some good news here. It looks somewhat like the other one. Namely, it becomes smaller as you get further away by a square. And the direction is given by that same hat thing. It becomes a little bit more complicated than what follows. What makes a magnetic field? Let's start with that. I mean, over here, what makes an electric field is a charge density. And we have nothing of the kind here. So just out of conceptual understanding, what, what do we have to 
what, what, what creates the magnetic field? Dipole. Dipole by itself doesn't form. It has to be moving. Mm -hmm. Well, a magnet will work, right? So in principle, we could write down something like a magnet density. It's not wrong, but it's not what I'm going for. You see, magnets, the objects, these ores that you pick up from, from the floor, these things that you buy at the toy store, they have magnetic forces because there's charges walking around in that thing continuously. And of course, it happens all the time. Also, it also happens with me. I mean, I'm filled with positive charges around which negative charges are walking, like the electrons moving around my nuclei. And a moving electric charge behaves as if it's a magnet, right? That was one of these laws. That if you move around an electric charge, you get a magnetic field. So in principle, every atom is just a magnetic field generator because there's always a charge, electrons, moving around. Now the reason that I'm not a magnet <laughs> is for a very, very simple reason that all of my separate little atoms creating little magnetic fields all pointing in different directions, so they cancel each other out. It's the superposition principle again. If, if one of the atoms happens to be creating a magnetic field that points that way, that way you know, then there's also one other one that points the other way, they cancel each other out by superposition. So in principle, I'm a magnet. It's just all my little magnets of peace not pointing in the same direction. What if you would be able to make sure that all the little separate magnets in a piece of material all point in the same direction? They all make little magnets and they all point in the same direction. And this whole thing becomes, there's no cancelling out of magnetic fields a piece. And you get this big magnetic field, which is just the sum of all the smaller ones. This is why magnets only work with some metals, because the metals are have a structure in their in their atoms, right? At the very least, you need to have the protons organized regularly. And then you have to make sure that they all point in the same direction. I mean, have you ever noticed that pieces of wood are very difficult to magnetize? The only thing you have to do is make sure that I, no, that's fine. The only thing you have to do is to make sure that if you have a piece of metal, and you know a metal by definition is one that has a where all the nuclei are in some roster, that means that the, that the protons are already properly aligned. You just have to make sure that the, all the swirling electrons all swirl in the same direction. So all the separate uh, uh, little magnets that you get all point in the same direction. So what you do if you have a piece of iron, say, which is not already magnetized, you just take one big magnet from the outside. It will turn all these smaller magnets, all these small atoms in the same direction. You let go of the bigger magnet, you throw it away, you look at your piece of iron. Now all of a sudden, all these little atoms are pointing in the same direction. And this is why you, how you can magnetize pieces of, I mean, I'm sure if everybody's done it as a child at some point. You took a piece of metal, you scraped a magnet uh, over it a couple of times, and then the thing itself was magnetic for a couple of minutes. The effect decays, of course, at some point, because at some point, just by heat and such uh, effects, all the little atoms just start moving around in, in, in separate directions again. Anyway, so that's the idea. So yes, we can have a magnetic charge or magnetic, uh, uh, what's the word here, density. But ultimately, all this magnetic density is really just a result of moving charges, either by atoms or by, by some other means. And the symbol that we're going to use for that is called J, capital J. It's a new thing. J is a functional space. It is it's itself a vector. What tells me is uh, in what direction charges are moving. It's a vector. It tells you what direction charges are moving at the position R. Right? It's like a river, say. You have a nice little channel where all the water flows in the same direction. And everywhere where you go and look in, in that channel, you will find the same value of J. It all, the whole water points all in the same direction with the same velocity. But if you have some turbulent river or something with some angles or steep declines or something like that, the amount of water that flows into a certain direction 
differs from position to position. But that is that thing over there. But instead of water, you take moving charges. Now, physicists just call this current, right? Electrical current. So it's just current by definition. And as I just explained to you, a moving uh, electrical charge can produce magnetic fields, so it's obvious that it's in there somewhere. And then it says, up to experiment and tell you how exactly it is in there. And it turns out that there's a cross product. Note that this thing gives you the direction. And in principle, what you should also put in there is numbers. I mean, there could be some number in front, and this is up to experiment to determine what the overall constant is. And in this case, it's again the 4 pi, and some other numbers called mu zero. Mu zero, again, is purely because we happen to have chosen our units in a particular way. I always choose my units such that mu zero is just one. It isn't in, in the usual units. And again, I have to look at what the actual number is if you're using the usual meter seconds and such. And here it is. Mu zero is four pi. You can tell it's just defined in that way. Worry too much about the actual values. Again, it's a matter of choosing your units. Oh, and then you have to integrate of all space. If you want to have a total amount of magnetic field, of course, what you need to do is look for current everywhere because each and every piece of current will give you a certain amount of magnetic field, and the total amount of magnetic field is just a sum of these things. Why is there a cross product in nature? be very clear again. We're going to sweep over volume. I'm going to look everywhere in this room how much current there is flowing at every point. Right? You see that there's a river, there's some water flowing everywhere. At every point we're going to see how fast in what direction is the water flowing. That gives me J. And J depends on where I happen to be looking. Before we called it r primed in this equation. It's the same r primed. There we go. It just means I'm sweeping over my volume here. I'm looking everywhere how much current there is. How much current I'm looking at a particular place is called r primed. And then I want to, what I want to know is how much does it reach me? And before what we did, we took R, capital R, which we defined, is where I'm looking for a current minus where I'm, where I'm, where, from what point I'm looking at it. Remember this definition from before? Same definition. This could be very clear. Also, it gives me a good opportunity to, look, to learn some names here. Louis, right? Okay, well, there's some current over there. I want to know how much of his magnetic field is reaching out to me. His and then sweeping over the volume here. At some point, to get to him, that is R prime, where he is. I want to know where how much of that field reaches me, which is R without the prime. That's my position. How much of his magnetic field reaches me depends on how much distance there is between the two of us, which is capital R, the difference between our two positions. That's the interpretation of these different R's. That's what it says. Now this law, just like this one is called Coulomb's law, this one is called Biot-Savart. And we're going to take it as an experimental fact. This is Coulomb. In the principle we're done. You tell me how much current there is flowing through this volume. I do this crappy integral over here. I get the magnetic field here. I want to know how much I'm being pushed aside, I take my magnetic field, put it into this equation, I know how much I'm being pushed around. That's what it says. That's the first of the three. 
Now, we can do two things now. Um, I promise you three equations for each situation, electrostatics and nanostatics. Um, the mathematical derivations of these are somewhat more involved than that one. Now, we started later, certainly about 20 minutes or so. I would like to keep some time, of course, for exercises. So how, how I, I propose to do this. I just give you now what the other two versions are of this one. We can work it out in detail at some other time. I can write it down. I can make a video of these things. So you will have seen it at some point. But for the physics, maybe it's better just to give you what they are. And just you just assume for me right here, right now, by mathematical means without putting any new physics in, just like we didn't here, this is mathematics, we can write this as two different types, okay? And then at some later point, we will just fill in the details. Well, there they are. What you do? This thing. Let's take the curl. Do you know what curl is? All right. Remember that I had to tell you at some point what divergence is? There's also a mathematical operation that takes a vector and also takes a derivative. It's just a different derivative. Remember that I said vectors come with all different types of derivatives, necessarily because the thing itself has three directions. Some other type of derivative that plays a major role in theoretical physics is called the curl. I'll just write down the definition in a second, and I'll just first write down what the answer is. Okay? If you take the curl of this thing, and curl we notate this is what we call a curl. Again, I will write down in a second what the mathematical definition is exactly. It's not the main point right now. If you take the curl of this thing, And you do some mathematical steps that I'm skipping now. And it's a piece how looking up, I see. Right? You're looking up the, uh, the curl. There is a Stokes theorem in there. That is absolutely true. For the people who have followed, who, what was this course again? Mathematical? Mathematics and natural science. Okay, well, these people probably know that with curls, there's also sort of divergence theorem that turns an integral over a curl into something else. Just like the divert the integral of divergence over there gave you this surface integral, you can also take the integral of a curl, it gives you a line integral. So it, 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 it's the same type of trick. It's called Stokes theorem. Anyway, I apply Stokes theorem somewhere in this calculation and I find this. This is the one of the other ones that I wanted to show you. There you go. Now, given that at some point you know what a curl is, can somebody tell me why it's useful to have an equation like this if I already have this one and they tell you the same information anyway? Regardless of exactly what the mathematics means, this is application. Can you tell just by looking at these things? Yes. That's not that, yeah, that's it. it. It's the same trick as here. No, you're exactly right. What we had here was if you know the charge density, you can calculate the electric field. And mathematics, 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 you get, if you know the electric field, you can calculate the charge. Here's the same thing. This one tells you if you know how much current there is at a point in space, you can calculate the magnetic field. But if you want to know the opposite calculation, Chris comes in and it just feels your magnetic field, he wants to know how much current there is, he uses this one. That's all there is to it. Then there's a final one. Again, skipping the mathematical steps. There you go. That's the third one. Somebody sees a blue marker. That's the third one. All right. Well, in the electric case, what we saw was this third one. We told you if you took the amount of electric field that's sticking out of the walls, it tells you how much 
total charge there was inside those walls. That was what this one told you. Here you have a similar thing. Suppose that I take some uh, circular disk here or something like that. And I hold it at some place in space. If there's a current going through this room, then there will be some of that, that stuff floating through my disk. I can calculate that amount, which is calculating how much there is at any point on that disk, right? The total amount of current going through the disk is just calculate how much per piece of disk current there is for the total amount. That's all there is to it. And then there is this theorem that knows, again, it's called Stokes theorem, that tells you instead of calculating how much current is going through every piece of the disk, just take the circumference of the disk. Take all the current over there, and it gives you the exact same number. That's what it says here. If you have a certain piece of magnetic field sticking through a disk, and I want to know how much there is, it's exactly the same thing as just taking circumference of that disk. That's this one. Circumference of the disk with the amount of magnetic fields going through it gives you this number, and I here is the amount of current just going into a straight line. The current that you have in your electronics workshops, your pairs. Now, why, when would you use this one? Well, again, depends on your, your physical situation. These three are, again, exactly the same formula, just the application depends on one to the next. Now, the final thing I will do is write down what a current, what, what a uh, system called a, uh, I'm blanking on the word, oh, curl, thank you. I knew when I was going to see you and I thought that's not curl, it's curl. Just like what we have here, it's a small notepad that tells you what a divergence is. I'm going to write a small notepad here that tells you what a curl is. Now you have a vector. Could be a force, could not be. But one thing I do know, it depends on its three directions, f, x, f, y, and f, z. A curl is written as such. No deeper meaning involved. It's just a definition. Itself is a vector, and the vector looked, looks as such. What you do, you take the derivative of f y with respect to z. From this you subtract the derivative of this one with respect to y. Right? I mean it's sort of like the same thing but y and z replaced. We're not there yet. It's a vector, it comes in three components. Second component, and then there's the third one. F X Y That's a complicated expression, isn't it? That's what we call the curl. Just a definition of a thing. Now, why is it exactly this thing? Again, it's just definition. The real question is, why has nature decided to use this particular definition for a derivative? Well, one thing you already know, in the Maxwell equations, two of the four equations were divergences, and the other two were curls. So nature has decided that this is apparently how she goes. So it's good to have this definition. If I give you a vector now, you can just calculate what its curl is. Note that the curl is itself a vector. A divergence meant you put in a vector, you got back a number. A curl is different. You put in uh, a vector, you get back a vector. Oh, that's right. Cross coordinates. Sorry? That's right. Cross coordinates. Yes. Cross -coordinates. Yes, exactly. The, I mean, yeah, exactly. The cross product, as you know, uh, for two vectors would have given you back a vector. 
Now, nature apparently has decided that magnetic fields go with curls and electric fields go with divergences. Why do we do that? Now, given this, you can in principle calculate this. Forget about the mathematical steps in between. Same principle. Somebody tells you what the current is. Do some difficult mathematics, get back magnetic fields, calculate how things are pushed along. That's the idea. Any questions? Yes? How is the <coughs> divergence in the curve related? Do they use the same symbol? Yes. Um, well, do you know the definition of a cross product with, without the curl, without the symbol? And uh, the, this thing in vector calculus, we call this little dot here, we call inner product. Do you know that definition? Okay. There's no separate board. If you would define this thing that I use in both cases, that, that, that's your question, right? Yeah. We use the same symbol. It's called nabla, by the way. And if you just define nabla as itself a vector, but a vector of derivatives, it's not really a vector because it's just, and you just apply your definition of a divergence of this thing on this vector, you get exactly this. And if you apply a cross product with this vector and this vector, you get that. So this is why they use the same symbol. 